In this four-part unit, we will explore some important ideas from the Enlightenment period that influenced the way people thought about government. We will then look at how many of these ideas later became part of the Declaration of Independence. We will highlight some differences among colonists concerning American independence, and we will briefly discuss some reasons for American victory in the Revolutionary War. In today's technological society, I think it's hard for us to think in terms of a period in time when men saw nature as something unknowable. The scientific method is, I think, one of the greatest gifts of human culture in allowing us to separate myths and dogma from reality. Many of the roots of the scientific revolution in Europe um, are anchored in alchemy, attempts to synthesize gold out of base metals, which encouraged early experimentation with chemistry and physics. Sir Isaac Newton was interested in alchemy. We, re we remember him for, for physics, but his initial interests were, were alchemy. Newton had introduced what we today call the scientific method. At the time, it was revolutionary. He insisted on a new approach to science, which was not to just state rules and maxims, but rather the idea that science had to prove itself over and over again, and that each hypothesis stood ready to be taken down by the next one, essentially. The scientific method is like a, a razor designed to separate what we can prove is real from those things which are simply claimed. They looked at lightning, they looked at earthquakes, they looked at other natural phenomena, and they sought natural explanations. It wasn't enough for them to say, God wills this. You have to remember, that during this period of the Enlightenment, when these scientific ideas were coming to the fore, the church was the ultimate authority about how the world worked and what you should believe. And what was so revolutionary about the scientific method is that it was essentially democratic. It said that no power, no person, uh, no, no organization, no ruler can tell you what reality is. This was not just an incredible advance in human knowledge, but also, at the same time, a lot of skepticism towards the role of these institutions that heretofore had been utterly beyond questioning in these societies. Once you begin this discovery, this, this method of scientific knowledge, you can't put it back. It's like letting a genie out of a bottle. Scientists have been finding out ever since that truth, according to scientists, changes all the time. Scientists are constantly revising what they think to be true. But nonetheless, they hold on to that, that idea that truth is out there and we can gain it, we can find it through the scientific method. In part one of this unit, we will analyze the political ideas of John Locke and those expressed in Thomas Paine's Common Sense to see how they helped shape the Declaration of Independence. Focusing question. How did the ideas of John Locke and Thomas Paine influence Jefferson's writings in the Declaration of Independence? Main idea. New political ideas about the relationship between people and their government helped to justify the Declaration of Independence. The revolutionary generation formulated the political philosophy and laid the institutional foundations for the system of government under which Americans live. The American Revolution was inspired by ideas concerning natural rights and political authority, and its successful completion affected people and governments throughout the world for many generations. The Declaration of Independence, for me, is one of the best pieces of writing I've ever seen. It's a revolutionary document for a revolutionary statement. You cannot help but be stirred when you read those words. Thomas Jefferson's writing uh, is absolutely magnificent. And when he wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. That was the first time anybody had bothered to write that down. And then you 
turn the clock back and think of when he was writing, how young he was, what a statement it was given the history of the world at that point. And you feel the excitement of being on the cusp of something so profound that it's hard to put it into words. If you review our Declaration of Independence, it has those beautiful words about all men are created equal and governments are formed among men to represent the people. It was a good statement of what we were all about. And that's the only thing people remember about the Declaration of Independence, that it was about all men are created equal. But it's really a roughly a 28 count indictment against King George. And therefore, because of the, the way in which the British Crown treated us, we now declare that we are a free country and we want to let you know why now. We're going to have a war. We're going to have a war. In 1776, you have the Continental Congress meeting in, uh, in Philadelphia, debating uh, a unified position for the colonies with respect to the hostilities that have already broken out. And the fundamental issue uh, between them is, are they fighting for their rights as Englishmen within the British Empire, uh, or are they going to fight uh, for independence? And they're seriously divided. People who are perfectly willing to re uh, resist the tyranny of the British government are not necessarily willing to strike for independence. But there's a groundswell in favor of it, I think in large measure because they recognize that having provoked the lion this far, uh, there's no going back. All of a sudden you have this group of people who are going, no, we're, we're not part of some great chain of being with the king at the top of it. We are free people. We, we can vote for who we want to have in charge. And we're not going to tolerate you telling us that we have some class status we have to be trapped in. It says, you know, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, meaning that Parliament in London, the king himself, uh, the courts cannot interfere and take away your rights because the state can't take power from us. It's a, even to this day, it's probably the most central difference between America and every other country in the world. It goes well beyond what was needed in order to declare independence. It, it establishes a philosophical basis for a civil democracy in which all persons are guaranteed rights by virtue of their personhood. This political genius, not just in Jefferson, but in Adams and all the other people who collected here, they saw a new time for humankind, which is that we can be free and that we can make decisions for ourselves. The Ideas of John Locke The period known as the Enlightenment in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries saw the development of new ideas about the rights of people and their relationship to their rulers. John Locke was an Enlightenment philosopher whose ideas, more than any others, influenced the American belief in self-government. Locke wrote that, Quote, all people are free, equal, and have natural rights of life, liberty, and property that rulers cannot take away. All power, check that, all original power resides in the people, and they consent to enter into a social contract among themselves to form a government to protect their rights. In return, the people promise to obey the laws and rules established by their government, establishing a system of ordered liberty. Government's powers are limited to those the people have consented to give to it. Whenever government becomes a threat to the people's natural rights, it breaks the social contract and the people have the right to alter or overthrow it. Locke's ideas about the sovereignty and rights of the people were radical and challenged the centuries-old practice throughout the world of dictatorial rule by kings, emperors, and tribal chieftains. Thomas Paine and Common Sense Thomas Paine was an English immigrant to America who produced a pamphlet known as Common Sense that challenged the rule of the American colonies by the King of England. 
Common sense was read and acclaimed by many American colonists during the mid-1700s and contributed to a growing sentiment for independence from Great Britain. In part two of this unit, we will evaluate how several key principles of the Declaration of Independence grew in importance to become unifying ideas of American democracy. Focusing question, how did the Declaration of Independence become a roadmap for the new republic as it extended the franchise, provided for equality of opportunity, and guaranteed unalienable rights? Main idea. The ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence contradicted the realities of slavery and the undemocratic nature of political participation in the early decades of the New Republic. The Declaration of Independence. The eventual draft of the Declaration of Independence authored by Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, reflected the ideas of Locke and Paine. Jefferson wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Jefferson then went on to detail many of the grievances against the King of England that Paine had earlier described in Common Sense. In part three of this unit, we will describe the political differences among colonists concerning separation from Great Britain. Focusing question, what differences existed among Americans concerning separation from Great Britain? Main idea, the ideas of the Enlightenment and the perceived unfairness of British policies provoked debate and resistance by the American colonists. From the very beginning, colonialism in America meant competition. European countries were eager to gobble up as much land as possible in the New World. Sometimes this competition turned into open warfare, and the French and Indian War is a perfect example of this. Here's a crash course of five things about the war to get you up to speed. North America was a big, beautiful place full of endless opportunities, and Great Britain and France each wanted a piece of the action. The British controlled their 13 colonies and were looking to expand west. The French occupied Canada and were looking to expand south. It was inevitable that they'd bump into each other, and that's exactly what happened in the Ohio River Valley. 
an important trading area with access to the Mississippi River. The French and Indian War marked the debut of 21-year-old George Washington, a lieutenant colonel for the militia in the British colony of Virginia. In 1754, he was ordered to protect a British fort near what is now Pittsburgh. On the way, Washington encountered a French military unit and the two sides fought in the first battle of the French and Indian War, the Battle of Jumonville Glen. Washington was young, but he was quickly gaining the experience he would need to eventually command the Continental Army. Years of territorial scuffles turned into full-blown declarations of war in 1756. As fighting broke out, the British and French sought allies among the local Native American populations. The French were familiar with many tribes through trade and recruited the Potawatomi, Winnebago, Ojibwa, Mississauga, and the Huron, while the British turned to the Iroquois Confederacy. At first, the French were winning, a lot. They simply had more troops and better supplies than the British Army and drove them back towards the 13 colonies. But the tide turned in 1757 when British Secretary of State William Pitt took control of the war effort. Dreaming of a vast British empire, he made it his mission to defeat the French in North America, pouring in generous funds to beef up military resources on the ground. The war ended with the French defeat at the Battle of Quebec and the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. The British gained control of Canada and all land east of the Mississippi River. It may seem that the British made out well after all was said and done, but there was a catch. You see, William Pitt borrowed heavily to finance the French and Indian War, which left his nation in tons of debt. To make up for it, the British taxed American colonists up the wazoo. Americans didn't particularly appreciate this. Years of protests, rallies, town hall meetings, and petitions would eventually lead to the American Revolution and the creation of the United States. The French and Indian War may not have had the glorious battles or fearless heroes of other great conflicts, but it was one of the most consequential wars in American history. It also opened the eyes of a young military leader to the tyranny of the British, a man who would go on to be the first American president. Anglo-French rivalry leading to conflict with the colonies. The rivalry in North America between Britain and France led to the French and Indian War, in which the French were driven out of Canada and their territories west of the Appalachian Mountains. As a result of the war, Britain took several actions that angered the American colonies and led to the American Revolution. These include, one, the Proclamation of 1763, which prohibited settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains, a region that was costly for the British to protect, and two, the Stamp Act of 1765, which placed a tax on legal documents. Taxes were also placed on tea and sugar to pay the costs incurred during the French and Indian War and for British troops to protect the colonists. This is a selection of shots from stock footage by the Parliamentary Archives featuring the Stamp Act. You could see it there in the original Act Room in the Parliamentary Archives. We're now in the Parliamentary Archives search room where I'm unrolling the Stamp Act to show you the title on the outside. And here is the title close up. You can see the word there, America. This is the start of the Act. And this is further down the act, referring to putting a duty on buying packs of playing cards. And this section of the act refers to duties on cards, pamphlets and newspapers. The beginning of the American Revolution. Resistance to British rule in the colonies mounted, leading to war. The Boston Massacre took place in March of 1770 when British troops fired on anti-British demonstrators. The Boston Tea Party occurred in December of 1773 when members of the Sons of Liberty, disguised as Indians, dumped a shipment of British tea into Boston Harbor. The First Continental Congress was called in the fall of 1774, to which all, the, all of the colonies except Georgia sent representatives. This was the first time most of the colonies had acted together 
to address the problem with Britain. War began on April 19, 1775, when the Minutemen in Massachusetts fought a brief skirmish with British troops at Lexington and Concord. It's April 19th, 1775. The sun is rising on the village of Lexington, and the first battles of the Revolutionary War are about to begin. 700 British soldiers march into Lexington at daybreak. They're on their way to Concord with orders to confiscate hidden weapons. Waiting in a tavern for the British are 77 colonial militiamen, a group of untrained soldiers. We're talking about a bunch of farmers very, very part-time soldiers. And they're facing these impressive-looking ranks of red-coated British soldiers. The colonists aren't surprised to see the British. In fact, they've been warned by spies like Paul Revere, who spent the night before riding through the area on horseback, giving out information on British troop movements. They're all standing there. They're all armed. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. And then, Somebody fires. Nobody knows to this day who fired first. But once the shooting started, then everybody, all these armed men, leveled their weapons, began blasting away. Eight colonists fall dead or die, and 10 more are wounded. The victorious British regroup and begin marching towards Concord. In nearby Concord, the British discover the weapons they're looking for, three massive cannons, and smash them. But the colonists confront them on a bridge just outside of town battle erupts. Dozens die on both sides, but here the colonists defeat the British, who retreat back towards Boston. The colonists can't believe they've won. At the time, nobody realized what the significance of this skirmish was. It was Americans against British on this one morning. But it turned out that this skirmish was the first battle of the American Revolutionary War. It was the first step toward American independence. Differences among colonists. The colonists were divided into three main groups during the Revolution. Patriots believed in complete independence from Britain. They were inspired by the ideas of John Locke and Thomas Paine, and by the words of Virginian Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death. They provided the troops for the American army, led by Virginian George Washington. Loyalists, also known as Tories, remained loyal to Britain because of cultural and economic ties. They believed that taxation of the colonies was justified to pay for the British troops who protected American settlers from Indian attacks. Neutrals, our third group, were the many colonists who tried to stay as uninvolved in the war as possible. In part four, the final section of this unit, we will discuss reasons for colonial victory in the American Revolution. Focusing question, what factors contributed to the victory of the American rebels? 
Main idea. The American rebels won their independence because the British government grew tired of the struggle soon after the French agreed to help the Americans. Franklin quickly learns to play politics French style. He becomes a master of that uniquely Parisian institution, the Salon. It is at these late night dinner parties that the movers and shakers of French politics could themselves be shaken and moved. So again, it's Franklin adapting. He realizes the pace of life is different. He realizes the approach to work is different. And he realizes that much is done on a very social platform. Franklin was a salon superstar, primarily because he was witty and supremely accomplished. But Ben also dressed for success, one of the great masquerades of his career. And he understood almost at once, almost intuitively, that the French would not be impressed with some pretender trying to dress as elegantly as they did. The way to their hearts was to be a simple backwoods Quaker. Franklin was never a Quaker. Franklin never lived anywhere near the backwoods in his entire life. But he began sending back to his buddies in Pennsylvania, I need shipments of coonskin caps and those ludicrous coonskin caps that he had never worn in his life. He begins wearing to every salon, to every public appearance. He played it to the hilt. the French were enthralled. And as Franklin's fame grew, so did the envy of certain other Americans. In particular, Franklin's ease with Parisian women, whom he sometimes referred to as his mistresses, stands in stark contrast to the tortured efforts of John Adams, another member of the American delegation. Franklin and Adams had two very different approaches to the French. You can even see it in the way they learned the French language. Franklin talks about how he learned to speak French by lounging on the pillows of his French mistresses. Whereas Adams learned to speak French by memorizing a volume of French funeral orations. So they have a totally different style. He speaks of Franklin's charm as if it ought to be a controlled substance or something. And there's almost an eternal friction between the sort of classic over and classic underachiever, between the class nerd and the most popular guy, between Adams and Franklin. He goes to Paris and he discovers that Franklin is the lion of French society and Adams is a nothing. In fact, the people of Paris get him confused with Samuel Adams and they're always, well, they end up just calling him the other Adams. Even routine office work ended in fits of sputtering rage for the other Adams. John would be at work early and Ben would stroll in at noon after a late night at the salon. Adams thought it was ironic that the person who had spoken about early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. John Adams had grown up on Poor Richard's Almanac, and here was the author of Poor Richard's Almanac not following that kind of advice at all. But Franklin understood that he was actually getting more business done for the American mission at two o'clock in the morning in somebody's salon than Adams did at eight o'clock in the morning in the office. That's simply the way the world of Parisian politics worked. In Ben's view, John was a mixed blessing. He means well for his country, noted Franklin, and is always an honest man but in some things absolutely out of his senses. The French find Adams even more annoying. The foreign minister refuses to deal with him. It is Franklin who patiently works the French government for more than a year. In February of 1778, after learning of a significant American victory at Saratoga, Louis XVI finally signs on the dotted line. Next to George Washington, Benjamin Franklin is probably the most indispensable person when it comes to winning the revolution. Now, what had been a trickle of covert arms becomes a potent battlefield alliance. A steady stream of weapons and soldiers arrive in America. France then provides 90% of the gunpowder we used in the revolution. 
The Marquis de Lafayette has almost as many French troops at Yorktown as George Washington has American troops. So that's what allows us to win the revolution militarily. Still, battlefield successes must be translated into diplomatic terms. After the decisive victory at Yorktown, Franklin and a team of American envoys would spend two years haggling with the British over details of a final peace treaty. In the end, the British realized that it wanted to have America as an ally. And Franklin is able to play off Britain against France. So they're both competing to have better alliances with America, because they realize that America is going to be the great trading and economic partner in the new century. And it ends up with Franklin uh, being able to make deals with both of them. With the signing of the peace treaty in 1783, Benjamin Franklin had added diplomat to his long list of achievements. He was perhaps the most accomplished man in the world, a fact not lost on any number of women on two continents. One has only to peep through the keyhole of history to glimpse another facet of this remarkable man. You might say Ben Franklin was the 18th century's preeminent heartthrob. Factors leading to colonial victory. Diplomatic factors. Benjamin Franklin negotiated a treaty of alliance with France in 1777. Americans benefited from the presence of the French army and navy at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, which ended the war with an American victory. The war did not have popular support in Great Britain. People back in Great Britain would rather have seen an independent America than continue sending their sons to die in a foreign land. Military factors. George Washington, General of the American Continental Army, avoided any situation that threatened the destruction of his army. His leadership kept the army together when defeat seemed inevitable. 